Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Hey, TBC, for our last weekend of guest preachers is Ross Lester. Ross is at the Austin Stone down in Austin. You will pick up on very quickly that his accent is not from Austin, but I'll let him tell you that story. He's the preaching pastor at the Austin Stone. Welcome to the stage, Ross Lester. Good morning, Village Church. I know we've just met, but I need to ask you a favor. We have some people who are outside, currently don't have a seat, who need to get a seat. And so if you have an open seat in the middle of your row, why don't you just squish in, um, just move in and take up some of that space, and that's gonna help the ushers to seat the people who are waiting um, uh, outside to get a seat. <laughs> Church is the same all over the world, except you guys actually obeyed, so uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> When I say stuff to the people at the stone, they're just like, don't tell me what to do. Um, and so, you guys listen, thank you. Thanks so much. All right, good morning, what a privilege to be here. Matt was actually incorrect. This is the new Austin accent. Uh, that's how pretentious that city has become, all right? And so we all speak like that now. Um, everyone's into soccer, and you all know soccer is the gateway drug to socialism. Um, and after that comes fusion barbecue and all that kind of stuff. And so we're into it. That's just how we live. It has changed um, a lot. I've actually only been in Austin for four and a half years, um, like most people in that city. Um, I am from another place. I am from the leafy suburbs of the great city of Johannesburg, South Africa. And I know some of you are struggling to imagine suburbs on the African continent. We have them, they're beautiful. They exist on the Eastern Plains, just beneath the rocky outcrop where Rafiki first held Simba um, <laughs> aloft. So everywhere that the light touches is now just developed in master plan um, communities. Thanks a lot, Disney. What a privilege. It is to be here. It's one that I don't take lightly. It isn't lost on me. This church is very influential across the globe, and I know that you know that, um, but I consider this a real joy and a real privilege today. I don't know how I got invited into your summer series. I mean, you guys have had some heavy hitters, right? And so just to manage your expectation, I find that joy in life is, is through managed expectations. If you think most things are just gonna be meh, nah, then sometimes you're surprised and they're kinda cool, right? If you think everything's gonna be awesome, then most things are pretty disappointing. And so set your expectation at just a guy with a strange accent and a Bible who's just gonna point you to Jesus today and you'll be fine. I'm not as wise or godly or profound as Ray Ortland that you had a few weeks ago. Um, Papa Ray, as I like to call him, right? Because I want him to be my grandpa. Ray has mastered the art of the dramatic pause and the deep stare. And when he does it, people just repent. They're like, thank you, Jesus, <laughs> right? When I do that kind of thing, people call security um, and have me escorted out of the building. I'm um, also nowhere near as cool as last week's speaker, Ryan Kwan. Um, he is an incredibly cool man. You know, you know you have coolness down when you have the confidence to just stand up here in the pulpit with your ankles on full display um, <laughs> to the world. That's when you know you're just so cool that no one can critique you. I mean, dad ankles as well, or dankles as I like to call them. Um, but wasn't Ryan great? Didn't he bring such a great word from Hebrews um, last week? I, I, I will be speaking to him um, about a more sensible trouser option for the future. Don't worry, we're working on it. As I came here this week, I was fully prepped to preach a message from First and Second Samuel. We've been studying the life of David together at the Austin Stone. What an incredible three-dimensional human. Complicated, but loved by God. A sinner, but in covenant relationship with the Almighty. What an incredible thing to, th uh, to, to think about. And I was gonna talk about his friendship with Jonathan, um, which I thought would be a helpful message. But then life interrupted in a very real and very human way in the Leicester household on Friday afternoon. 
My wife's family still live in Johannesburg, which is very far away away. We hate being so far from them. And on Friday, we got two phone calls. The first one was from a hospital in Johannesburg where my father-in-law is being treated for some ongoing health issues. They called to say that it wasn't going well and that the trajectory looked pretty bad and that if we could get on a flight, we probably should. While I was just processing through that news with my wife, the next call came through a few minutes later and it was from my mother-in-law who was sobbing on the other side of the phone to say that my wife's sister, Claire, had very unexpectedly passed away at 49 years old. It rocked our world quite a bit to lose someone we loved and to hear the news that we probably need to be in preparation to lose someone else we love. It's had us very reflective over the last 48 hours. Sue was still committed that I should be here and share the word today, and so I'm very grateful that she said I should still come. Um, but when I honestly couldn't sleep on Friday night, and I was wrestling with the Lord, I decided to review my sermon notes because that normally puts anyone to sleep. <laughs> um, and so I took them out on my phone and I was wrestling through them and I just felt a sense of disquiet. The sermon as it was written was true, right, even helpful perhaps, but it wasn't what I needed on Friday night and I'm not sure that it's what we need this morning. And so I'm very thankful to everyone here on your incredible team who was able to pivot as I rewrote a sermon yesterday afternoon and sent through notes last night and they were able to make everything work. And so I hope that you'll just bear with me today. This is gonna be very human (laughs) and a bit of a public kind of uh, counseling session with a couple of thousand of my closest friends. (laughs) Because, yeah. I mean, don't clap yet, it might be terrible, Um, but. (laughs) I needed on Friday night and I need today the comfort of the revelation of Jesus Christ in the midst of the difficult season. I was like, Lord, show me what's really going on. And so as I process this through with you guys in lifetime, my prayer is that the Spirit will meet my need and yours as we study the word together and as we look at our King Jesus Christ. And so Revelation 1 is where we'll be. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. I'm fully aware that the best preacher in America, Matt Chandler, taught through this last year, right? I'm fully aware. He yelled at you all for 45 minutes um, about helicopters and vaccines and the mark of the beast, and some of you even came back, which is remarkable, Um, but he taught such a helpful introduction um, from Revelation 1 last year, and I know that it was excellent. But I also know a couple of things about sermons. Um, Firstly, people forget pretty much the moment uh, they walk out of here what the sermon was about, Um, and I don't think Matt's excluded from that. But secondly, I know that the word is living and active, and so I know that it moves and it meets us in different times and in slightly different ways. And so I'm hoping that even though many of you have heard from this chapter pretty recently, uh, I pray that it hits you fresh this morning and gives you a fresh revelation of who Jesus is. What does it have for us? Why was it comforting for me in the midst of a sad season, two o'clock? Saturday morning, I just opened my Bible. Revelation 1 was a tonic to my soul. Why? Well, here in this, in this moment in redemptive history, we find the Apostle John exiled and alone and probably wondering what it all meant. Probably wondering what was happening in the world. You see, think of the humanity of John for a second. When we read Revelation, right, we get into the mystery of the spiritual nature of what is revealed, and that's good and right. But think of the humanity of the scribe. Think of the one who receives this revelation and has to give it to us. Who is he? Well, he's an old man, John the Apostle. He's near 90 at this point, he's, he's, he's outlived all of his peers. He's been exiled onto a rocky prison island as punishment under the brutal emperor, the mission who's trying to kill Christians wherever he finds them. But he was one who had held a special place in and amongst the early church. He was the disciple that Jesus loved dearly, which he's very quick to tell us, right, in all of his writings. He, he rested his head on Jesus' chest. Think about that. He knows Jesus so well. He saw with his own eyes and heard with his own ears Jesus do and say the most amazing things. Things that had upended his very ordinary life up until that point. Things that he had lived in light of since then. Think of what he saw. He saw Jesus killed. He saw Jesus raised from the dead. He saw Jesus ascend back to heaven. 
He then saw the church spread from Jerusalem to the ends of the known world, from Jews to pagans and Gentiles. He then watched the persecution rise. And John saw or heard of, think of this, receiving letters of the news, heard of the brutal execution of all of his friends. His whole peer group, gone. In fact, John himself had been brutally persecuted physically and according to some, they had tried as hard as they could to kill him and he just wouldn't die. And so eventually they go like, just go sit on an island and be no trouble, right? Because we've tried all sorts of things and you're just a tough old guy. But John is sitting on this island of Patmos bearing deep scars on his body and on his soul. Picture him sitting in the dirt, running his fingers over the scars from when they've thrown rocks at him or when they've tried to burn him alive. He had helped to plant and pastor churches in Asia Minor. They must be in his mind and in his heart. He found himself separated from those churches. No way to contact them. An old man living as a prisoner of the world's most corrupt and violent emperor. He must have wondered what the plan was. He must have wondered what Jesus was actually up to. He must have wondered what was really happening in the cosmos, what is really going on? What's the thing behind the thing? Give me a glimpse past the curtain so that I can see what's really happening. He must have wondered what Jesus meant when he said it would be better for them when he left. He's like, Lord, you said that and this, this isn't better. This feels worse. He must have wondered what Jesus meant when he said he was returning soon. He saw the ascension, Jesus was basically be right back, right? And John was like, ah, can we define soon? Because first we stood there looking into heaven. You didn't come back that day, which is pretty awkward. Got a stiff neck. And then we went back the next day, didn't come. And then the next day, and then we kind of stopped looking at the sky. And now it's been 60 years. Where are you? Where are you? What did you mean? He must have wondered what Jesus meant when he said that he would be with them, even to the very end of the age. He's like, but Lord, I feel alone. And so just like us, in the midst of the bumps and the scrapes and the difficulties of our very human lives, John must have wondered what was really going on in the universe. And in the midst of all of that, Jesus appears to him and shows him some stuff. He gives him a revelation. Now you know, because Matt taught you last year, that that's the actual purpose of the book. The word revelation is the word apocalypse. It literally means the unveiling. And so when you read the revelation of Jesus Christ, it means the unveiling of Jesus Christ as he really is. It's a pulling back of the curtain, a sign, a glimpse into ultimate reality past the things that are currently blurring your vision and distracting your attention. Uh, An opportunity to see things as they really are. Don't you wish you could have these? I think that's why um, conspiracy theories have become so popular in part because we're going, We know we're being lied to, right? I just don't know by who or to what extent. Probably by everyone and a lot, right? But I just wanna pull back the curtain for a second so that I can figure out what's really going on. Have you ever experienced this with other people? They're so confusing to you and then they invite you in in humility and the curtain is pulled back and you go like, oh, you're still confusing to me, right? But now I see some of why you're so perplexing because you're more complex than I thought. I get to see a reality that I wasn't aware of before. This is what Jesus does for John, a supernatural unveiling, a pulling back of the cosmic curtain so that he and me and hopefully you can get a glimpse in the midst of our very ordinary human lives what is actually happening in the universe and what will happen in the heavenlies in the days to come. And here's the thing, friends, about Revelation. It ought to change us. Because the truth of reality ought to change our current posture to things in the world. So this morning, that's all I wanna do. I just wanna pull back the curtain a tiny bit. Won't you just look behind it? into heavenly reality with me just for a moment? What is really happening in the heavenlies which we can't fully see through the pain and difficulty of our circumstances? Verse one of Revelation one. The revelation, the apocalypsis, the great unveiling of Jesus Christ 
which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So what Jesus is gonna do for John and the churches in Asia in in Revelation one to three is not just to give them a roadmap for how it's gonna play out, right? It's not like, okay, so here's what you gotta look for in terms of the future, but also a glimpse into what is actually going on in the heavenlies in the there and in the now for them, the stuff behind the stuff that they can see. It's what they really needed. It's how they were going to endure the persecution that was ongoing for them. And it's what we really need. It's how we're gonna stay faithful. We need to see what's really happening, right? So what is really happening? If this is an unveiling of Jesus Christ, the reality of what he's really like, well, what is he really like? Verse four, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. Oh my this text, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. You think your life's out of control, just remember, pull back the curtain, he is, he was, he is to come, just remember the eternal one. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. First observation, I've just got five for you today, and then I'll get out of your hair and head south into liberalism, right? Um, (laughs) When we glimpse behind the curtain, we remember that the God of the universe meets us and meets us with grace and with peace. The God of the universe, the one who was and who is and who is to come, meets us and what's his posture? Grace. What do you think about when you think about an encounter with God? What would his posture towards you be? When you think of the eternal one engaging with you, meeting with you, what would be the first things out of his mouth? Disappointment, anger, confoundedness, John says, oh, I am confident, it's grace, peace from him, the firstborn, right? (laughs) How do I know this? Well, the seven churches that that this is addressed to, they aren't doing all that great. There's nothing new under the sun, right? But yet John knows that the first word to them from the resurrected Christ is grace and peace from God the Father. And so he is so certain that he can begin there, right? What do you think God would say to us? What would be the first words? What would he say to the church today? We expect the first words of the messenger of the resurrected Christ to churches that are struggling, to churches that are failing, to churches who aren't representing Christ well in their day and age to be, come on church, wake up, get it together, right? You're embarrassing. That's what we expect the Trinity to say. Guys, you're making me look like a fool in the nations. Stop it, right? Pull yourself together. And then we expect him to get into like, I kind of like you and you're my people. But where does he start? He starts with, ah, oh, grace and peace to you. He says this greeting is from himself and from Jesus Christ the faithful. He's speaking on Jesus' behalf. This is astonishing. John, who knows Jesus better than any of us, is so certain of the grace of God that it is his default engagement point for others, even and perhaps especially for those who are struggling. Friends, listen. Are you a certain recipient of grace? What do you think God meets you with? Or like so many in Christian churches around the world today, do you speak of grace, but actually run your life and the life of others and the life of your community as if you are actually reliant on karma? As if that's the governing principle of the world, that if I do more good than bad, then I will get more good than bad, and that is the way to do it. And so when I don't do more good than bad, and if I can't do more good than bad, what do I do? I pretend. 
and I invent false versions of myself and then I feel empty, why? Because people love that false version of me and it's not me and I know that. And so what do I do with the real me? I just go on Instagram and just make up another one. And that's the way that I feel some kind of love and acceptance, but I'm using karma when grace is available. (laughs) And karma is so exhausting because we can't tip the scales in our favor. Let me ask you a couple of personal questions. How do you know that you're not a certain recipient of the grace of God? First question is a test. Are you trying to appear to be better than you are? You know what that's saying? I don't expect grace. I don't. And so I have to create something else that I know will be accepted. I know Matt says all the time, it's okay to not be okay, but you don't know how I'm not okay this is. And so I create this facade, this ruse. That's a sure and certain sign. You're not a certain recipient of grace. Second one. <laughs> What kind of repenter are you? When you mess up, what comes next? Is there a long gap between sin and repentance? Or do you run towards the grace of God? We should be joyful, fervent, exuberant repenters. Not sin managers trying to cover up a reputation. You can defend your reputation or you can repent, but you can't do both. You can't do both. And the joy of the Christian life is that we are certain of grace and peace. So when I mess up, I don't wallow in guilt. What I do, I run towards grace. And I declare it publicly because it's so good that I want other people in on it. And so I don't hide my sin. I go, I did it again. I'm such a fool. Now look what awaits me, the grace of God. That's crazy. Anyone can get in on this. That's why Luther said, if you're gonna sin, sin boldly, right? When you hear that, you go, wait, what? You can't say that, that's Texas, right? We're, we're, we're not like, he said if you're gonna sin, sin boldly, why? Because that sin leads to the greatest moment in a Christian's life, which is the mercy that awaits us when we repent. And that's our greatest joy. Church Father Augustine, this has popped into my head at two this morning in the Marriott, right? Praise God that what pops into my head at two in the morning in the Marriott is theology. Um, and so, um, praise the Lord for the common grace of being a geek. But I remembered this quote from Augustine and so quickly looked it up this morning. Augustine said, be ashamed when you sin, but don't be ashamed when you repent. Sin is followed by shame. Repentance is followed by boldness and joy. Here's what Augustine said as a warning to the church. He said, Satan has reversed this order and he's given boldness to sin and shame to repentance. Friends, if you anticipate grace, you're a joyful, liberated repenter. Your friends, your community, your spouse, they know your sin because you know you'll receive grace from Christ so you don't hide it. So you don't hide it. But also, are you a giver of grace? If you receive so much grace, do you give it to others? Are you a believer of it at work in the life of others? John sees grace for these churches and he's gonna correct them. You know what I love? First Corinthians chapter one. You guys read First Corinthians? It's like an HBO show, right? Maybe even HBO Max. It's like, right? There's some stuff that goes on in there. There's a lot of correction that needs to happen, right? But how does Paul start to the church in Corinth? What does he say to them? <laughs> he says to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father. That's how Paul starts the church in Corinth. His default posture is grace. You fools be messing up and there's grace for you. There's grace for you. Friends, do people in your orbit anticipate that when their weakness bumps up against you, they will be encountered with grace? Or do they think they need to perform to tip the scales in their favor? because that's the way you run the economy of your heart. Look behind the curtain. What's the first thing you see? Grace, grace, let's go on. Second part of verse five. Oh my goodness, I can barely read this, guys. To him who loves us, 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 
and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Friends, when we glimpse behind the curtain, we remember a second observation, that God loves us. He loves us. His grace isn't begrudging. Some of you can get to like, okay, there's grace, but it's because, you know, he had to kill his son, and so now he goes like, will you get grace, because that's the legal deal. No, no, what drove that? What drove him to send the son? What drove the son to go to the cross? He loves us. He adores us. And we don't need to question it, right? We've stretched this little English word love beyond its reasonable bounds to make it meaningless, right? I can say that I love barbecue and I love my wife and you understand that, but you do just hope that I love them in different ways, right? Um, But we use this one word. But John goes like, no, no, I don't want you to empty this, this word love of its meaning. So he also provides the evidence of its love. He says, I don't care if you don't feel it, I know that he loves you because he has freed you from your sins by his blood. And so now you don't just need to go, oh, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. On Sunday, oh, he loves me. I raised my hands today, I gave 12%. He loves me, right? But Tuesday, mm, Tuesday is when we sin, right? So now he loves me not. Now I need to go back and get in the cycle and he'll love me again. No, 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 no. If you believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, sent by the Father and died on the cross for your sins, you cannot possibly believe that God doesn't love you. It's not available to you, logically. I've been with my wife a very long time. Pray for her, I mean, my gosh. It's a lot, right? It's a lot, poor girl, right? Her sanctification is just a lifelong project, I feel for her. Um, But we first started dating in high school and I I was like most high school boys. I didn't know what to do, it was totally dumb. And so we didn't get it right and so we had a couple of false starts to our relationship and eventually, I think it was about the third one, I was like, no, no, in now, this is gonna work, right? Nah, I really like this girl. She made me be friends for a long time, it was crazy. Um, but then we started to actually date and get our relationship on a good footing and we we're just a few dates in and I was an idiot and um, uh, with all the intensity of a 19 year old boy, I looked across the table at her one night and I said to her, I think I'm in love with you. And it was the 90s, so I thought the Smashing Pumpkins were gonna come serenade us, and um, it was gonna be a magic moment, you know, boombox on the, um, on the shoulder, and, and she was gonna go, I love you too, and it was just gonna be incredible. And she looked back at me, gosh, I love this woman. She said, I know you think you do. Let's wait and see. And you were right then, I have to marry this girl. I have no choice. This is, this is God's finest creation, is what she was saying. Don't just say it, don't just feel it, live it. What is John saying to us? These aren't empty words. He who loves us and has freed us from this, our sins through the shedding of his blood. Look how he describes it in 1 John 4. He doesn't wanna leave this in the abstract for us. He says, in this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world. Here's how you know it's true, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so I'll say it again. If you believe that Jesus is the son of God and that he really died on the cross and it was really for your sins, then you simply cannot come to the conclusion that God doesn't love you. I don't care what you've done. I can see from your blank stares that I'm unable to articulate this to the point that actually moves us. And so let's go to the Prince of Preachers. Charles Haddon Spurgeon spoke about this verse a long time ago. Chucky Spurge, as I like to call him. Um, He gets a lot of airtime in my sermons because he was a boss and because he finished the race, right? And so uh, that's why I tend to quote uh, dead people because I go like, I know how they finished. Um, And so with modern scholars, I go like, let's see, right? There might be a podcast soon, so let's see. Let's wait and see, right? Look at what Spurgeon says, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, friends. He loves us. This is a matter for admiration and amazement. Oh my brethren, this is an abyss of wonder to me. I can understand that Jesus pities us. I can very well understand that he has compassion on us, but that the Lord of glory loves us is a deep, great, heavenly thought which my finite mind can hardly hold. 
Jesus loves us. Grasp that. He loved us before the world was. He loveth us now with all his heart and he will love us when sun, moon, and stars have all expired like sparks that die when the fire is quenched upon the hearth and men go to their beds. His heart is knit with your heart. Oh, he loves us. Us. What if we just sat in that for a second, right? I know the temptation is to get out of here and to get moving, but what if we just sat in that for a second? Here's my experience as a minister of God's word. I am utterly persuaded of the love of God for you. I am. But I know me. (laughs) And I know how hard I am to love. And so it's way harder for me to believe it for me. But this morning, by faith, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I want to say along with my big brother in the faith, the Apostle John, to him who loves us. Even us. Even frail and weak us. We're gonna get to say it later as we take communion. When I take communion, I always think of Psalm 116. Forgive me if this feels irreverent, but it's just the way that it works in my mind. Psalm 116 says, I will lift up high the cup of my salvation, right? And so when I take communion, when we get to the cup part, I like to think of proposing a toast to my salvation, right? And this morning when I take communion, I'm gonna lift high that tiny little shot glass. (laughs) And you know what I'll say? To him who loves us. To him who loves us. Listen, let me just say this before I move on. Some of you, your hearts are just a bit dull. You're like, I just can't, I just can't get there. Romans 5, 5 says that God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Just ask him now, Holy Spirit, show us. Pour the love of the Father and the Son out into our hearts that we might know how you feel about us, all right? To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priest to God, uh, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. Third one, when we glimpse behind the curtain, we remember that in reality, in spite of what we might be seeing, God is at work in the church. God is at work in the church. Friends, I know that evangelicalism can be like a bit of an embarrassing moniker to carry at the moment, right? We go like, oh man, I wish we would stop acting like such fools. I know that some of you wish that you could follow Jesus without a church. My experience though is the church is the only place for you to be a Christian. (laughs) It's the mechanism, the body that's given to believers. Uh, Look at John. These churches were as messy as ours. They had moral issues, faith issues, compromise issues, leadership issues. But John says, you've been made into a kingdom of priests. You're still God's handiwork in the world. What is your view of the church? Think of Peter. Peter saw some of the worst in the church. He saw some of it in himself. Some failed leadership, some shameful things. But look, when Peter describes the people of God, he says, you're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, you're a people for his own possession. God's not ashamed of you, why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Listen, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Friends, I know, I know that it feels like the church isn't in a good space in the world. I flinch at every new podcast episode. Who's next? Who's gonna flame out? Who's gonna fail out? It's it's troubling. I am sometimes, as a leader in the church, frustrated by the sins of the people in the church. I am always frustrated by the sin in the lives of those who claim to lead the church, because I'm one of them. It's like Eugene Peterson says, it's not bad enough that the church is full of sinners, it's also led by sinners. And so there's gonna be complicated things and we must repent when we wound people and when we fail. But we also mustn't forget that real reality, pull back the curtain, God is building something out of this massive dysfunctional family known as the global church. 
Just think about the millions of gatherings around the globe today. Think about them in the Horn of Africa, gathered together, reading the word, taking communion, baptizing believers. It's unbelievable. God is building something. Lift your head. Lift your head. And consider your connection and your commitment to a local church. It means something. It really matters when you pull back the veil. He's building us into a mighty kingdom of priests. All right, I'm nearly done. Golly, I've taken too much time. Down to verse nine, let's land this plane so quickly. We're gonna come in from 30,000 feet to zero in a heartbeat. It's gonna be like being on Southwest, okay? Here we go, verse nine. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned. It's been a while since John saw his friend. He looked different then. To see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair of his head were white, the hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace and his voice was like the roar of many waters in his right hand. He held seven stars and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Ah, oh, friends, behold the resurrected Christ. When we pull back the curtain, we remember that our King Jesus is truly magnificent. And that yes, he walked the earth as a humble Galilean peasant, but now he is resurrected and ascended. And he's our King and he's worthy of our worship. He's wearing priestly robes. And the sash of a king, we need that precious combination. He's a priest and a sympathetic one, knowing the needs and the weakness of his people, but he's a king. So he isn't caught in the mess and the weakness of his people. He's able to lead and direct and protect and rule and reign. And friends, he has white hair, which we try to hide in our culture and context, right? But this was seen as a crown of honor and of wisdom. Right, A sign of wisdom that comes with age according to the scriptures. But think of the wisdom that his white hair represents because he's been there for eternity. He hasn't just had a long life. He's had an eternal life. And so he knows it all. And he may have white hair, friends. (laughs) But he doesn't have fading or dull eyes. He has eyes of fire that see all. Oh, friends, imagine John. Imagine John. He knows those eyes. He knows his friend. But now they hold something that he didn't see before. Something that simultaneously pulls him into a deeper stare, but also simultaneously makes him avert his gaze because he realizes, oh my goodness, we are friends, but we are not peers. We are not the same. You're my sympathetic high priest, but you're also my king. One of my favorite things to do when I was still living in South Africa is to go to the bush. You would call it going on safari. Um, that's just something we allow Americans to call it so that they'll send dollars, right? We go like, sure, call it whatever you want. Um, and so we'd go on safari and we'd track animals. And this is gonna sound strange for Texans because we would track wild animals and then we would look at them and then just leave. <laughs> um, you can look at something and not shoot it. It's the weirdest, it's the weirdest thing. So come talk to me about it afterwards. It's very strange, you're like, how? It's possible, okay? Um, and yes, hunting's part of the ecosystem, and yes, if you're a big hunter, email uh, matt at thevillagechurch.net. Uh, so, um, but we were in one of my favorite reserves. Oh man, I don't have time. We were in one of my favorite reserves, and we heard of this, this moving pride of lions that was very rare pride of lions because it was led by two brothers, and normally brothers would start their own prides. These two brothers hunted together, and they had their own little group of, uh, of lady lions and little baby cub lions, and they were dominant in the area, and we heard that there was an opportunity to see them down on the southern plains, and so we jumped in our open side land vehicle, and we went out there, and there were just signs of them everywhere, right? There'd been a kill earlier in the day, and their, their footprints were everywhere, and so we 
were tracking them, but we could not find them. This massive big plane with eight foot high uh, grass wisps, and, and we looked and we looked and we couldn't find them. Eventually it was getting dark, and we said, let's go have a drink down at the bottom of the plane. So we went down, we headed to the bottom of the plane, we turned off the engine in our open-sided Land uh, Rover, and, and some of the guys had a gin and tonic. I'm a Christian, so I had uh, uh, Coke Zero, and uh, we're, 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 we're sitting there just enjoying the moment, eating um, heaven's own jerky, which is called biltong, which is a, a, a dried beef that you're all gonna eat in heaven, it's amazing. Um, and, and I'm sitting sitting with a bag of biltong in my lap, right? And we're just sitting there and it's dark, the sun's setting over the savanna and, and suddenly I just become aware of a breathing sound. And I'm like, you really need to get into shape. Um, this is embarrassing. But as I look, 30 feet from me, 10 yards, lying in the grass is the big brother lion and he's looking straight at me <laughs> and he has these golden eyes and he's just locked onto me. And so I just very calmly passed the bag of biltong um, <laughs> across into my friend's lap. And I dare not take my eyes off of this lion, right? But I dare not make a sound either. No sudden movements. And we sit and we just stare at each other for a few minutes. No one else even knows he's there. And as he looks at me, you know what I think? We are not peers. John gets to look into the burning eyes of the lion of Judah. And his friend who loves him is not his peer. He's not his peer. He's different. Look at how John responds to his old friend. I promise I'm gonna wrap this up. Here we go. 8,000 feet. Verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. How does Christ respond to that posture of humility? He laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. I love that image. You know that on the way out the tomb, Christ took the keys. He was like, you're not gonna need these anymore, right? I got them, and the dominions of darkness were like, fair enough, we didn't see that coming, right? And so you crack the code, you take the keys, we can't touch it, right? Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this last observation, promise of getting out your hair. When we glimpse behind the curtain, we remember that our response to a revelation of Jesus Christ should be wholehearted awe and worship and wonder. There's no coolness in this response, no coolness. There's worship. A 90-something year old man hurls himself into the dirt at the revelation of the magnificence of Jesus Christ. Friends, is there a chance that we maybe have become too flippant with our king? And we've lost some of our awe. I hear a lot of people say to me today, when I see Jesus, I have lots of questions that he needs to answer. No, you don't. In scripture, when we see Jesus glorified, when people get to see him, there are no questions. There's only worship and awe and wonder. And he's safe with us in that space, friends, because look at what he does. He puts his hand on John. He doesn't say, that's right, grovel in the dirt. He rests his hand on him, that fearful right hand of authority, the fearful right hand that will judge the nations, and he encourages him up. But look how he encourages him up. He doesn't say, don't be scared, I'm not that big of a deal, you've got it wrong. Rather, he says, don't be scared because I'm more of a big deal than you ever imagined, but I'm with you, and I love you, and I'm for you, and you're part of my people. Now, don't be afraid. Write this down, John. There's work to do. Let's go build a church. That's our King. That's our King Jesus. Some of us just need to remember that this beautiful friend of ours is the first and the last. And that our only proper response is to fall face down at his feet. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins through his blood. Here's my prayer for you, friends. I pray that God gives us eyes to see what's really going on in the universe today. I pray that this revelation of who Jesus is and what he is doing gives you courage, even in the midst of difficulty. 
pray that some of you would adjust your posture to him today, that you would fall at his feet. I pray unashamedly that he upends some of your lives. Let's let the spirit pull back the curtain. Behold the grace of the Almighty. Behold the love he has for us. Behold his power at work in the church. Behold his eternal majesty. And in response, offer him wholehearted worship. Some of you are delaying obedience. Your worship today is just obey him. Some of you are delaying repentance because you're trying to manage your reputation. Your worship today is to repent boldly and to run to his grace. Some of you are Christians, you've never been baptized. You don't wanna be all in. There's no other way to be. If this is true, the only response is, Lord, send me, I'm yours. Go speak to some elders, they'll baptize you today. You can do it today. But all of us, let's bow our knee as we sing. And then when we take communion, let's raise our glass and look behind the curtain and say to him who loves us, oh, I can't wait to see him. Father God, thank you for your word. Won't you imprint your word on our hearts today? Won't you help us to see behind the curtain? Won't you give us a revelation of your son, Jesus Christ? Oh, Lord, you love us. Help us to believe that. Help me to believe that. Oh, Lord, your son has the keys to death and Hades. We don't even need to fear death. We don't need to fear loss. Help us to trust him. And oh, Lord, you meet us with grace. Help us to believe you and to run to you in faith. I cannot wait, Lord. I cannot wait to see Jesus Christ. In the meanwhile, just give us a glimpse. In his name we pray.